With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. And welcome in, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I do apologize for not being able to do the show yesterday. Everything's been a mess with the NCAA tournament, which, by the way, my beloved Auburn Tigers are going to be playing in the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2003. And you will have all your coverage for that on Sports Radio 740. So I will be working the soundboards for that. So certainly I want you to tune in and check that out. And that's the reason that we're starting the show a little bit early today. And we may even have a, a little bit of a special sort of after dark episode a little bit later, depending on how the schedule goes. I'm sorry, the whole thing's chaotic, but the tournament's going to be over pretty soon. So this is not going to be something that will will be permanently in, uh, interfering with the show and the show schedule. So I wanted to mention this really quickly before we went into anything else. We did get some sad news this week, Tuesday after the show. Dimitri Polisos, who is from the Montgomery area, he has been a longtime representative in the state of Alabama. He had a massive heart attack and then passed away on Wednesday. Now, personally, I was never a huge fan of, of Dimitri Polisos from a political standpoint, but I, even though I never actually met him in person, have talked to many people about him and my mom actually knew him and everything that I heard about him was that he was a decent guy. Now that I think is a great illustration of you can disagree with somebody politically and still think that they're a good person and still want the best for them. And it is really tragic to hear that representative Polisos has passed. I know that he's been a fixture in this community for a long time, and our thoughts and prayers, which are important and do matter and do make a difference, are with the Polisos family. We certainly do pray for their healing and comfort in this very, very difficult time for them. Now, I do want to also mention, you may be wondering about my garments today. Well, as you guys know, I made this promise a long time ago, back when I was just a radio show, didn't even have a podcast yet. Back then, one of the things that I talked about was I got so sick of the left constantly bullying and attacking and going after Chick-fil-A, despite the fact that they only espouse a traditional biblical view of marriage, and that's not even at the company level, that's just their founder who is no longer even alive, and yet people kept attacking and kept going after that corporation, and I made a promise that I would always try to give Chick-fil-A free publicity and actually go out and eat a meal with them every time the left attacked them. Well, you may remember just last week we had one, and I mentioned it. It was on my Twitter feed. It was on my social media. And I actually had my Chick-fil-A with me while I was watching Auburn in their last game. And so I'm hoping that there's some good luck there because Auburn played an amazing half of basketball. In fact, I think that first half of their previous game in the 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 second round there, that was the best basketball that Auburn has played all season, bar none in my opinion. And that was a really really good team, a really great game, and Auburn, I mean, they just killed it. And I'm hoping that not that I'm superstitious, but I really do hope that that luck continues because I'm going to be going to Chick-fil-A again because New York Magazine has gone after Chick-fil-A yet another time, and trying to discourage people from eating there and saying that they're homophobic and people shouldn't eat there at all, and we should discourage that, which, just another liberal attack. I could go through why that's ridiculous and how stupid it is, but I've done that so many times on the show, I've about decided that instead of continuing to beat a dead horse, 
I'm just going to give them a little love, a little free publicity and go out to eat there because I do think that they wind up standing on their own and that the, uh, the truth is going to come out on that. So wearing my Chick-fil-A shirt today, going to be posting pictures tonight of me enjoying the Auburn game while running it from the Sports Radio 740 sound booth and be enjoying my Chick-fil-A tonight while I watch Auburn hopefully trounce the North Carolina Tar Heels. I think that starts at 6.30 tonight. Pre-game probably starts about 6. I'm not sure how much of that we're going to run because there are other games to cover. But anyway, that's what we're doing. We certainly encourage you to listen to us there. And uh, we're really excited about it and also excited about the Braves season, which just opened up yesterday against the Phillies. Braves did not have a good start. There's no question about that. But News Radio 1440 is your home for the Atlanta Braves all this season right here in Montgomery. If you want to listen to the Braves on the radio, News Radio 1440 is the place to do it. So now that we've said all that, we do want to get into some serious news stories of the week. Alabama has, and I think this is the most important thing we could talk about. There is a group here in Alabama that is working on a full-on ban of abortion. Now, this comes in the wake of a string of attempts to try to curtail abortion in other states. For example, our neighbor to the west, Mississippi, has just signed into law, their governor has signed into law, a heartbeat bill. And this seems to be the year of the heartbeat bill because it's only March and we already have Mississippi passing one. We've already had Ohio, sorry, not Ohio, Iowa pass one earlier this year. So the heartbeat bills are exactly what they sound like. They protect any child as long as that child in the womb has a detectable heartbeat, which would mean this is very, very early in the developmental stage of the baby. And this means that if you can detect a heartbeat with an ultrasound, that baby has to be protected just like you would any other life. And I believe that that stage usually happens right around 12 weeks. And most women don't even, they can't even tell that they're pregnant until about two, three weeks in. And so because of that, that leaves only about a span of 10 weeks for abortions. Is it getting rid of abortion? No, it, it still continues the horrific and barbaric practice of killing children in their mother's womb. However, this greatly decreases the ability and the time in which you can choose to do that. And so these heartbeat bills, I really want to give kudos to Iowa and Mississippi for passing these. There are several other states, I think seven in total, that have these heartbeat bills. North Dakota is one. And right now, Georgia is looking at that right now. So we certainly hope that that passes in our neighbors over to the west. Or sorry, over to the east, Mississippi to the west. Anyway, so something different is happening in Alabama which I like better and I hope it passes, even though I know that immediately it's going to be a media firestorm. There is a group right now in Alabama that is working on a full-on ban of abortion. Just make it illegal in the state of Alabama. Now, uh, this is the Alabama Pro-Life Coalition and its president, Eric Johnson, has drafted this bill. So this isn't something that has been come up with by a representative or a senator. This is a bill that has been drafted by an outside group, but they are trying to drum up support for an out-and-out -out ban of abortion in the state of Alabama. And that's what's going on right now, which uh, we're really hoping is able to move forward. He said in a statement to, I believe this was to WSFA, he said that he wanted to protect all children and thus didn't go for the heartbeat bill because they asked him about that because the heartbeat bills have become so popular. There's one right now in Georgia. There's one right now in Tennessee that may or may not pass. He's saying, why go for the heartbeat bill when we're trying to protect all children? Which, I mean, you got to give him credit. That's what he's looking for. Swing for the fences, I guess. When it comes to why he wants to write this in such a way that it would just ban all abortion outright, no questions asked. His bill would do that. And so because of that, we certainly do hope that it passes. And if that does take place, I mean, it's going to be an uphill legal battle. There's absolutely no question about that. It is going to be an uphill legal battle because the second that this thing passes, if it passes, it's going straight to the courts. It'll probably immediately be struck down or at least uh, halted in while they're in the process of looking at it. And maybe there's a chance that this winds up in the Supreme Court of Alabama or even the Supreme Court of the United States. Good. 
they know that this thing is going to get challenged. And maybe, maybe this winds up being the bill that overturns Roe v. Wade. Now, I doubt it, personally. I think if this thing were to go through, the winning, or at least the smartest legal strategy to use here, is to argue a states' rights argument. Now, that's something that's compelling to me. I don't know how compelling it is to other judges. But to me, you could make an argument not only on the grounds that abortion itself is immoral, or that Roe v. Wade failed to consider the personhood of the child in the womb, which, by the way, both of those things are true. But I think you also have the ability to make a strong argument about the state's rights. So even if somebody, for example, does believe that abortion is okay and that you should have abortion legalized, there is a compelling separate argument about states' rights that this is a question that each individual state ought to handle. And when you're talking about things like murder and homicide, that's something that would be actually up to the states. For example, you know, murder is, of course, illegal across the board. All 50 states have laws against murder, but they have different laws against murder. And they have different laws on how those penalties would play out and, and all of that stuff. And so when it talks about crime and, and protecting the lives of its citizens, that is something that traditionally has always been a state, not a federal government's job. There are obviously some exceptions when it comes to national invasion or defense of citizens during wartime, you know, on the, the national level with the armies or Air Force or Navy or, or whatever else you want to call it. There is some level of federal defense that does take place. But as far as civil matters, domestic matters, things that happen within communities and within states, typically that is something that has been traditionally viewed as something the state is supposed to handle. And I don't understand why abortion would be any different. Now, granted, I'm somebody that believes that abortion should be illegal in all 50 states because I believe it also is murder. But my point is, if that is to happen, I still think that it ought to happen at the state level. Now, does that mean that there are going to be some states where this horrific, barbaric practice is going to continue? Yes, sadly, I think probably so. And we're going to see something not too dissimilar to what happened with slavery, in that there are going to be some abortion states and some non-abortion states. And unfortunately, that may happen for a while. But anything short of a constitutional amendment to protect the life of the unborn, which honestly, I would support that measure. I just don't think that it'll get enough support from the House and the Senate to actually pass. But if that were to go forward, it would be something I would support. But until that happens, until we have an actual constitutional amendment on the books, I still think, technically speaking, it's a state's rights issue. And so I think that is another legal strategy that we could use to try to get this horrific decision of Roe v. Wade overturned, which I think that, it, of course, it should be. So here's one thing that just sort of rewinding and going back to the base here, going back to what's happening in the state of Alabama with this bill. Currently, it has no sponsors. And I don't know that it's going to be able to pick up any. I have yet to see that that's going to be something that takes place. But I will say this, and I know that there are some good people, some people that I genuinely like in the state legislature. But here's the thing that I would say to them. Within the span of four days, we were able to ram through a massive hike on the gas tax. I mean, we were able to do that right away. And yet, it's taken us this long to get even to the point of a heartbeat bill or an abortion ban. This is the kind of thing that should be priority number one. This is the kind of thing that should be the focus of every senator and every member of the House of Representatives in the state of Alabama. And it irks me to no end that they were willing to go ahead and actually have a special session before the regular session even started to get this gas tax through, but they were not going to do the same thing to get this abortion bill through. And that really drives me up a wall. 
it shows where their priorities are. And again, I know that there are good people in the House and Senate trying to do their job. To them, I would say, you need to be supporting this bill because this is far more important than any gas tax or anything else that you're going to be dealing with with your tenure in the House of Representatives or in the Senate. And I don't understand why the gas tax was able to just sell through so easily when this thing didn't have a sponsor. If we don't pass this bill, and I understand that even if we do pass this bill, the odds of it being the thing that overturns Roe v. Wade are kind of slim. I actually think that the case that's going through right now uh, that my friend Laura Glidewell came in to talk to us about a, a week ago with Personhood Alabama that that actually has a much better chance of being the case that overturns Roe v. Wade. But what we're looking at right now, as far as the heartbeat bill goes, I just do not believe, or I, I do not believe that this particular bill is going to be the one that overturns Roe v. Wade. And so even if we pass it, I don't think that it's going to be successful. I would still vote for it anyway. You know, if nothing else, to stand on principle and to say that I voted for it. But if this doesn't pass and we can't do anything about this, we can certainly do the heartbeat bill. And so that would be sort of my message to the people of Alabama is that if we can't get this one, we certainly need to be working on something. And the heartbeat bill seems to be the next best thing. So if this winds up not going anywhere, we definitely need to get that one done. One other thing that I will say on this particular issue is that and I believe tonight is opening night, so it'll be the first night that it's open and in theaters. There is a movie that is coming out right now, and it's a, a not a huge Hollywood blockbuster, but it's certainly a movie that has enough steam behind it to be able to make some money. And I think that we really need to support it. I'm going to go to see it at some point next week because I you know, have a lot to do tonight, obviously, and, and can't really go to see it. But there's a movie called Unplanned, and it is the story of a woman named Abby Johnson. And she was a director, the youngest director in the history of Planned Parenthood for a Planned Parenthood center. And after some time there and after seeing the procedure itself, she becomes pro-life. And that's as much of the plot that I'm going to give away. I haven't seen it myself, so I can't give up that much. But that's what's very clear from the trailers. And I highly, highly encourage everybody to go see this movie. Now, one thing I do need to make note of, this movie is rated R. Why this movie is rated R is essentially because the people in Hollywood do not want kids to see it. Now, there is no swearing. There is no violence or anything like, I mean, this, based on what I've heard from people that actually have seen the movie, this movie could be a PG movie easily. But the reason they have it rated R is because of the scene where she's in the room while the abortion is happening. And the people that have seen it have told me, yeah, it's intense and it's disturbing, but it's disturbing because you're watching the dismemberment of a child. And the irony in all of this is, is that the pro-choice people that are anti-abortion and don't want this movie to do well, the ones that put the rating on it to try to keep kids and families from going to see it, are the very ones that would say, well, that's not a baby. That's not a baby. Why would it disturb you to see that being, I mean, that's no different than, than watching a medical procedure where someone cuts their arm off. And it's done in a medical setting, it's not like, you know, saw or something like that, where somebody has to dig in their eye to pull a key out or something, you know, insane like that. I mean, it's not gory for the sake of being gory. It's just, it shows the procedure of an abortion. And because of that scene and that scene alone, it's rated R, which really does get under my skin because there's a lot of movies and the, the PG 13 rating has been given out, I think a little too generously to some movies that I watch some stuff and I'm like, I can't believe they put that in a PG-13 movie. But nonetheless, that seems to be the latest ploy. And the reason that I bring that up is to tell you, parents, if you're watching this, the abortion itself is the only thing that you have to worry about as far as this movie. It's the only reason this movie has an R rating. And so don't let that discourage 
you from going to see this film. I mean, these are the same people that put together God's Not Dead and a couple of other films. So the reason that I'm bringing that up is just letting you know this isn't like some profanity-laced movie where people are getting their heads cut off or anything like I mean, it's not like your typical rated R movie. So don't let the rating scare you. And as horrible as it is, there are some things that need to be seen. When I was in D.C., it was incredibly difficult for me to go through the Holocaust Museum. But I had to. And I forced myself to do it because, as horrible as that stuff was, I needed to see what it was like. I needed to see the evil that humanity is capable of. And I agree that there's a certain age that it's appropriate and not appropriate for people to see things like that. And I understand that. And if you have really small children, I understand you not wanting to take them. But the reason that I'm saying it this way is that there comes an age where you have to look right in the face of evil so that you can understand what humans are capable of. That you can understand what people can become without the love of God in them. And it's true of the atrocities that we've seen throughout the 20th century with things like the Holocaust or the Holodomor or the Armenian Genocide. And sadly, it's also true here. It's also true with this horrific, barbaric, wicked practice where we sacrifice the lives of our children for the promise, and an empty promise at that, of a better, more easy future. Something that's going to be less complicated and not as hard on us. And sadly, that is where we stand. So, regardless of the rating, this is a movie that I think it's very important that people go see. And I would encourage you to do that. So, um, we're going to go ahead and, because I, I can't, I can't go on to our next story from that. I just, I can't do it. So, we're going to go ahead and take our first break and we will be back in just a moment. And now for a reading from the Social Justice Warrior Bible with Pastor Gregory Post. Welcome in. I'm Gregory Post, head pastor at the Eternal Living Word Transdenominational Community Church and Coffee House in Nevado, California. And now for a reading from the SJW Bible. Today's reading will be from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 2 through 10. And a centurion slave was sick and about to die. When he had heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Now Jesus was triggered upon hearing this and said, None of the good things he has done matter because he is a slave owner, and we must never admit that anyone that ever owns slaves is capable of doing anything good. Furthermore, instead of asking me for help, you should have passed universal health care by now so that he could receive treatment for free. Then Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my slave do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, this man is engaged in systematic oppression, he is clearly engaging in wage slavery by controlling the means of production to exploit the labor of those around him. Then Jesus gathered up a mob and protested on the centurion's lawn all night long with torches and signs reading, Down with the Patriarchy, terrifying him and his family. We never really found out what happened to the centurion's slave. Wow. So inspiring. 
Thank you for listening to this reading of the SJW Bible. And remember, the only truth that matters is your truth. Okay, and we're back. So we have a caller on line one. We're going to go ahead and go to the phones. Good afternoon. John from Millbrook. Good afternoon. What's on your mind? Just wanted to weigh in on this. As far as the movie is concerned, this is where this particular movie, mm -hmm. with if it's good and it's got a good story, then afterwards organizations need to, that are pro-life, need to make sure that that's on network television that it's on a movie channel or something like that so that people can have access to it, and in particular, our young people. They're the ones that need to see it the most. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more, and I think that it, as hard as it is, and, I mean, watching videos as I have, partly because it's my job and partly because I think I, I should, watching videos of abortions happening is very difficult to do. It is. It's not an easy thing to watch, but it's something that I think it's important to watch because we really need to understand what human beings are capable and, and honestly what we're capable of if we forget to live the way that God told us to. Well, you know, you know, I have an extreme view of this. It needs to be shown as dirty as it is. And because people need to be shocked by this. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things they do on television to get people to to contribute uh, to organizations that help with starvation and things like that, is they show how desperate those folks are. Uh, right. They try to shock people, and, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. And I think in this instance, too, the best thing that you can do, and one thing uh, Christian people need to do, too, is support something like this, because Hollywood needs to see it making money. Yeah, and that's actually a trend that has been happening the past few years, is that uh, movies with a Christian theme that are friendly, fa uh, family friendly have been really low budget films that don't cost a whole lot and yet are making way more than they put into them because there really well, is a thirst for that. Right. And, and Passion of the Christ, you know, the, the entire theater around here, the theaters, they'd have all six showing the same film at the same time because so many people were wanting to see it at once. Right. And the thing made $600 million. Mm -hmm. It was one of the biggest box office. And this thing, that's what I'm, my point, too, is that this movie needs to do the same thing to show that there are people out there that support this and are do want to be educated, and in particular, the young people. I mean, uh, it's never going to happen, but I wish every student, say, 12 or 13 and up, could see it. I, I agree, but the thing is, all they need is they, they just have to have their parents go with them, which, you know, I right. honestly think, even though I don't agree with the R rating, is better for the whole family to go anyway, so that yeah. they can talk about it afterward. But mm -hmm. one thing that I'll say about this, and with other Christian movies, you know, I've seen Fireproof and Courageous and, and several of the movies sort of in that same mold. And they're all really good movies. I enjoy them. I appreciate them, and I appreciate their value. This is the most important movie out of all of that bunch. Yeah, probably. I, so, I, I don't think, but because as great as they are and as inspiring as they are, this is something that needs to cause a cultural change. And that's yeah. the reason that I think when we're talking about significance, this is the biggest, most significant movie out of all of those groups. Well, I remember. Do you remember the movie a lot, uh, several years back that won several Academy Awards about abortion? Uh, I can't recall the name of it, but it was it was promoting it. Uh, Toby Maguire was in it. No, I honestly don't. Uh, Michael Caine was in it, I think. Uh, Cider House Rules. See, I, I didn't even know about this one. I, I'm unfamiliar yeah, this with this. Yeah, this is from a good, well, this is predating you. Um, I think Toby McGuire was. I know Michael Caine was in it, and of course Hollywood salivated all over the thing because it was a a place where women went to get abortions early on, and they depicted it as a a woman saving place, you know, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, it it uh, maybe it wasn't Toby McGuire, maybe he was too young for that. But I, I do know that Michael Caine, and, and it won several Academy Awards, and you can look it up, and people in the audience can too. 
the point about that is mm. they really pushed that. And it was, they were heroes. The doctors that were performing the abortions were uh, noted as heroes in the thing. Well, one thing you that know? you see in the trailer of this movie, too, is that it makes very clear, and granted, it's not a very long trailer, but it makes very clear that the woman that's involved in this, the main character, she believes that she's helping women and doing the right thing at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that is part of the reason that this film is, I think it's going to be good. I don't know. Obviously, I haven't seen it yet. But if it plays this off well, and what I mean by that is it shows somebody that was wholly committed to the cause of abortion, thought she was doing the right thing, thought that she was helping women, thought she was being compassionate by supporting Planned Parenthood and abortion, and then does a complete 180 and it's a real redemption story, then that is yeah. going to be something that really affects people because maybe somebody goes into this movie that doesn't thinks they know about abortion but doesn't really, and it, it might even change some lives. Who knows? Yeah. All right. Well, well thank you so much. Get on and get, sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. Um, one thing, and it's hard to transition from a topic like that to a topic like this, but there is a new legal challenge to the gas tax in the state of Alabama. And I do think it's something that we need to, to discuss. Tom Frederick says that he is going to file suit against the state claiming that the bill is unconstitutional. And the basis of this is that there is an amendment in the Constitution, which is Amendment 354, which 354 of the Alabama Constitution, I read it the other night, it does explicitly state that the only thing the fuel tax can be used for is public highway construction, maintenance, and law enforcement. So, in other words, if you are raising a gas tax, this is what this bill in the Constitution says, this is a part of our state constitution, that the only things that you can use it for are bridges, public highways, and law enforcement of those areas. So in other words, you could use it, presumably, I don't know if they actually use it for this or not, but you could use money raised with the gas tax to buy new cruisers, for example, or new speed guns for police officers' cars, state troopers, local police, whatever. Specifically law enforcement that pertains to riding on public highways. And so this is really the crux of his legal argument. And the reason that he makes this legal argument is he's saying that there is a chunk of the bill, a chunk of the money that has already been allocated to the Mo Mobile Port Authority. And the reason that they've done that is because they have a project that are trying to widen the port there. They're trying to allow bigger ships to come in, that sort of thing. And so because of that, he's saying, well, now hold on, our our constitution an amendment of the constitution actually states that you have to use it for these three things and so that's really the basis of where that's coming from which makes sense because right now the law diverts about 12 million dollars annually to the mobile port authority so a lot of the money that is going to be raised by this gas tax presumably goes straight to them and because that is something that is specifically earmarked in this bill He's saying that the amendment, or sorry, the bill itself is unconstitutional because it prescribes the state do something that would be against the Constitution. Now, here's the thing about that, though. Just taking a break from this particular gas tax at the moment, I didn't know that this amendment existed until I read this story and looked up the amendment itself. And it does say that, but right now, about 60% of Alabama's revenue is not not going to things like roads and bridges. And I'm not talking about just general fund taxes. I'm talking about specifically the money raised by the gas taxes now before this tax hike even started, before this bill passed, is going to things other than highway maintenance and building new roads. And that. So I'm just sitting here wondering, okay, how is that possible? And if that is true... How are there people not in prison for corruption and breaking the law of the state constitution by saying that these funds need to go somewhere else? And so that's a mystery that I'm going to try to dig into myself, and I don't know what I'm going to find, but it seems highly suspicious to me 
because I didn't know this provision in the in the Constitution even existed that said you have to spend the money on this when the money that is currently being spent or that is currently being gained from the gas tax is not being spent for those things. How is that happening? But getting back to the the story that we're on right now, the state argues that Section 24 defines navigable waters as public highways. And I'm reading a quote directly from Section 24 that they're saying negates his legal argument, that all navigable waters shall remain forever public highways. And the reason that that wording is in there, if you read the rest of the bill, it's trying to make clear that you can't privatize the waters of Alabama so you couldn't buy like a mile of the Alabama River and say this is my mile of the Alabama River that that's essentially the reason that this section 24 exists but it does define waterways as public highways and if that's the case then the money going to the Mobile Port Authority even though I might not personally like it it seems to me that the state's legal case is actually a lot stronger than this guy's case because it does pretty clearly define public waterways as public highways. And because of that, the way that the bill is worded and the way that the amendment is worded, it doesn't seem like this guy has much of a case. I hate to say that. I'd love to see this gas bill go down in flames, believe me. But I just don't see the legal justification for it. I think that there are several things that you could do to try to undo it. But as far as from a legal perspective, whether or not the bill itself is constitutional or not, I really don't think you can make that case, honestly. Now, if it were overturned, wouldn't they just pass a number, uh, another one? Because this thing sailed through, and I actually had a good friend of mine ask on social media the other day when she saw me posting the story. She actually specifically asked, well, what would be the good of getting rid of this bill through the courts? Because this thing passed by an overwhelming majority in both houses, and the governor is certainly on board. So wouldn't they just pass another one just like it? Well, that's a great question, and it's the reason that I'm bringing it up on the show now. So here's what would happen if this bill were overturned and they said that, nope, um, he's right. This bill is asking us to do something that the Constitution says we can't do. Ergo, we're striking down the bill. I don't think that's going to happen. But if it did, the state of Alabama would have two options. They could do one of two things. Either they could... Um, amend the Constitution. That would be one option. They could amend the Constitution to give some kind of clarity or to essentially say that the new gas tax could also be spent on waterway projects. They could amend the Constitution. But the reason that that would be something that would be more of a hang-up for them is this is not something they could pass in four days in a special session. If they had to actually amend the Alabama Constitution it would require a much larger vote and it would have to go to a popular vote as well. So essentially that would be in a de facto way, putting the ball in the court of the Alabama population. In other words, the people, not the legislature itself. And if that were the case, it requires a much higher bar, even though based on the numbers that we saw, it'll clear that bar in the house and the Senate. Then it has to go to a popular vote and be voted on by the people of Alabama. And if that's the case, I have no idea whether it would pass or not. There's been no polling on this. But at least it's a, a much bigger roadblock to this gas tax becoming law if that were to take place. Now, the more likely out of these two scenarios would be all they do is remove that provision that specifically allocates that money there. So they would essentially pass exactly the same gas bill or the, the exact same gas tax bill. The only thing is this particular, this new one would have removed that some of that money was going to go to the Port Authority. I mean, again, I don't see this thing being overturned, at least not by this legal argument. But if it does, then those would be the options that the House and Senate have. And so I don't see that happening, honestly. And then finally, you have the severability question. You also have the question of whether or not the Alabama Supreme Court or a lower court that gets upheld by the Alabama Supreme Court looks at that and says, okay, we're going to strike it down, but the rest of the gas tax stays. In other words, the court kind of takes the idea that 
we're going to strike down the unconstitutional part of it, but just the unconstitutional part. Striking it down doesn't necessarily negate the rest of the bill. And so the court would have to then sort through and decide, is getting rid of the money that would go to the Port Authority, is that something that's part of the whole bill, or is that something that we could just sort of get rid of and let the rest remain? Because the rest was constitutionally passed. I don't like the results of it, but let's be honest, it was constitutionally passed by a pretty wide margin. So that's also the option that you have, that the court could decide to strike down part of the bill, but not the entirety of the bill. And so th those are a, a few of the possible scenarios that could result from that. So I don't think this will work. And I think this particular case against the gas tax is honestly really weak. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to another local story because we are quickly running out of time. Doug Abortion Jones is back in the news and actually has been in the news several times this week. And the best way I could categorize this is Doug Jones is like a really, really bad secret agent. In other words, James Bond, the Mission Impossible guys, he's like a secret agent, but he's really bad at his job. <laughs> if you've ever seen the cartoon version of Batman, and I'm not talking about like the 90s cartoon, if, if you go on YouTube and search for how it should have ended and watch any of the ones with Batman in it, where every time he meets a girl that he just kind of thinks is attractive, that particular Batman, who's really meant to be more funny than serious, um, he just constantly tells women that he's attracted to that he's Batman. And he says, like, you want to know my secret identity? And so because of that, he's constantly revealing that he's Bruce Wayne <laughs> to women that he just thinks are somewhat attractive. And that's kind of how Doug Jones is, is that he tries to play off this game that he has a secret identity. He just really sucks at keeping that secret identity a secret. So that being said, I want to delve into what I'm talking about here. He's trying really hard to pull off this double lifestyle where he's trying to be two different people at the same time. But the problem is he really isn't fooling anybody. He has put out this week completely different messages to Alabamians and to fundraisers. So he's putting on one face, putting on one mask for the people of Alabama. And he's putting on a completely different mask for the people that are fundraising for him and trying to donate money to his campaign. And why is this? It's actually pretty clear. He knows that he can't fundraise very much in Alabama because the people of Alabama don't like him very much. <laughs> and so what he does is he tries to separate out his messaging to the people that are donating to him from the messaging of the people that live in the state who he's actually supposed to represent. And because he doesn't really fit in with the Alabama voters, he shows his true colors to his fundraisers. So what do I mean by this? You remember when he was campaigning here and he kept trying to convince everybody that he was a moderate, that he was a, a sort of a Dixiecrat, an old school Democrat that believed in family values and all of that stuff and was going to vote conservatively, at least on the social issues, but he just happened to have some Democrat leanings. That was kind of the, the facade that he put out there to the voter. That's what he constantly tried to communicate to us. But the thing is, any of us that were really paying attention, and I warned you about this, other people in Alabama warned you about this, Matt Murphy, Del Jackson, we were all talking about how this guy has a pretty distinct record of being a radical. And whenever he was talking to closed door meetings, he would talk like a radical. Well, just this week, he did another display of this. He put out several ads, none of which went to people in the state of Alabama on Facebook, which really shows his true colors. So let's look at this one. This is an ad, and you can actually see on the right side of this. By the way, we thank our friends at Yellowhammer News for putting this together. Um, you can see on the right side here, you can see the states that this ad ran in. California, New York. You'll notice that Alabama is suspiciously absent from this. And the reason is Doug Jones knows he does not want the voters of Alabama to see these messages because these are the messages he's sending out to fundraisers saying how liberal he is and how important he is to the Democrat cause. So if you'll read that ad right there, it says, don't take our word for it. 
Even election expert Nate Silver knows the path for Democrats to take back the Senate goes through Alabama. Doug Jones has to win for us to have a chance. But this isn't the only ad. Let's look at ad number two. Again, you can see over to the right, Alabama, nowhere on the list in this particular ad. So here it goes. Mitch McConnell would want you to scroll right past this message, but it's too important to ignore. The path to taking back the Senate goes through Alabama. Ad number three. The math is simple. We can't take back the Senate without Doug Jones winning in Alabama. We did it in 2017. Now Doug Jones needs our help again. Are you with us? Okay, ad number four. Same thing again. The path to 51 seats goes through Alabama. If we want to take back the Senate, we have to make sure Doug Jones wins. Are you ready to win? Help Doug Jones now. Ad number five. Doug Jones to uh, Doug's path to win is pretty simple. Register voters. Work hard in Washington for real solutions and tell the stories of the Alabama in truth. But we need your help to do it. Are you with us? Again, you'll notice Alabama is nowhere on the list for how these ads played out. And if you're wondering what these ads led you to, what these ads were asking you to do, when you click on them, it takes you to a fundraising page. That's what it does. And the link to this fundraising page reads, quote, if we want to protect the progress we've made, Doug Jones has to win in 2020. The future of Medicare, Social Security, and our health care, in other words, Obamacare, depends on it. You saw what happened when we came together in 2017, and we can do it again. Will you step up to make sure Doug has the support he needs to win? Chip in now to support Doug Jones for Senate. Okay, so did you notice a pattern in every single one of those ads? Every single one of those ads, which none of them went to people in Alabama, all of them went to people in states like California and New York, blue states. The running theme between all of them was essentially, if you want the Democrat Party's agenda to go through, you need Doug Jones. He's showing his true colors. He's saying, look, I'm on board with Chuck Schumer and the DNC and every radical, insane idea that they have. If you want those ideas through, you need Doug Jones to win. That is the message that he drilled home in all five of those ads, none of which went to voters in the state of Alabama. Now, why would Doug Jones do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. The guy knows where his biscuits are buttered. He does. And the reason that I say that is this is not the first time that this has happened. Back in February, he ran a national emergency, uh, sorry, anti-national emergency ads. You know, ads saying that he would stand against the national emergency declaration that President Trump put out there, that he was going to vote against it. And none of them ran in Alabama because he knows that message is super unpopular in the state of Alabama. And so because of that, you had Doug Jones again showing a completely different side of himself, portraying himself as a completely different kind of person to people outside the state than he does to people inside the state. And he's doing it because he knows that his stances and his policies do not represent the people in the state of Alabama. For example, Jones pulled in about $100,000 from Americans abroad. And to give you an idea of how unusual this is, Richard Shelby has currently raked in exactly zero dollars from donations abroad in 31 years of office. Now, Doug, uh, Richard Shelby, the guy has an amazing war chest. He has a lot of money in his reelection bid. He spent a lot of it against Jonathan McConnell in his past reelection. But the point in all that is, Doug Jones knows that he just does not get a whole lot of money from the state of Alabama because he doesn't represent Alabama. He is a tool for the Democrat Party, and he's taking up a space in a ruby red state, and he knows that. And that's why he's trying to say all the, to all these big Democrat donors that want him to do their bidding, and he does. He's saying to them, look, give me money or you're going to have another really conservative senator, senator who's going to be opposing all these things that you want. And that's the reason that they're giving him money. 
if you look at OpenSecrets.org, for example, out of the top five contributors, only one of Doug Jones' top five contributors is from the state of Alabama. And it's the University of Alabama. Now, you guys know I'm an Auburn guy, but look, sports aside and where I went to school aside, here's my question. I would be saying exactly the same thing if it were Auburn that was giving money to Doug Jones' campaign. Where the heck does a government entity like a state school get off donating money to one candidate or the other? I do not understand that. And maybe they do this too. I don't know. Maybe my own university, Auburn, is giving money to Doug Jones or Richard Shelby or other candidates. And if they are, that's wrong too. This has nothing to do with the fact that I'm not a big fan of the University of Alabama. It has everything to do with the fact that a state entity, a entity that is at least partially funded by your taxpayer dollars, is giving money to one candidate. Giving money. It would be wrong if they gave it to both candidates, but at least then it would be kind of more even. There is no reason for the University of Alabama to be donating a dime to a political candidate. They are a state entity. So I don't know why they're on this list, but they're the only donors out of this top five that happen to be from the state of Alabama. All the rest of them are from somewhere else. And do you know what his number one donor is? Alphabet Incorporated. Do you know what Alphabet Incorporated is? It's the parent company of Google. They're based in California. So yeah, those are the people that are putting money towards Doug Jones' campaign because they know that they're super, super far left and that their agenda is not going to get through if Doug Jones doesn't win. Or at least that's what Doug Jones is telling them. And, you know, based on the way the Senate went in the last election, they're probably right. But nonetheless, the reason Doug Jones is doing this is because he knows that he has to pander to them and tell them who he really is, tell them that he really is a far-left liberal Democrat. But when he campaigns in Alabama, he tries to do this thing where he campaigns as a moderate. It's very, very clear to anyone that's paying even a monicum of attention that Doug Jones is very, very far left. For example, Doug Jones ranks at a 15% on Freedom Works. So if you're looking at how they vote, Doug Jones ranks at about 15%. And you may look at that and like, okay, that is really bad. But 15% means that he does vote with Republicans 15% of the... No, that's not how Freedom Works does it. It goes with pro-freedom, anti-freedom. There's actually Republicans with really bad ones. But the point is, if you're looking for someone who is a conservative, Freedom Works is a pretty good scale to look at and see how people vote on different things. So Doug Jones from Freedom Works, 15% lifetime score. Chuck Schumer, about a 6%. So granted, much worse than Doug Jones on this. However, Senator Elizabeth Warren gets a 15% as well. And Cory Booker and Kamala Harris both sit at 17%. Now, I want you to think about this, Alabama. Kamala Harris and Cory Booker are more conservative than your senator. How insane is that? That Doug Jones is a sitting senator for the state of Alabama and has a worse freedom score than Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and is on par with Elizabeth Warren, all three of whom have approved and, and given their, even though they didn't vote for it, and we'll get to that a little later, but even though all three of them said of the Green New Deal, yep, great idea, we support it. A plan that would cost $92 trillion over the course of a decade. But yeah, Doug Jones is a moderate. Keep believing that lie. Well, when you, when you look at it, here's the problem. Doug Jones puts on that mask of being a moderate, somewhat sane Democrat whenever he talks to people in Alabama, but the second he's in a room with people outside the state, people that he doesn't need the vote of, people that he's trying to get money from so that he can continue to hold this spot that really should be a very conservative senator and hold it for the Democrats, he takes that mask off and reveals who he really is. 
I mean, this guy is the definition of two-faced. And since it's Friday, I did want to cover this story because I, I think that it's really, really fun. It turns out that there was a, uh, a story that ran the other day about a survey that was taken on millennials. And I kid you not, this is the actual headline of the story. Millennials say life today is more stressful than ever before. Here are their top 16 <laughs> reasons. So millennials, and I'm a millennial, I understand it. According to this survey, they are saying that human life is harder now than in, it ever has been. So despite the fact that we've all but eliminated starvation, extreme poverty, a lot of diseases, somehow now life is more stressful than it has ever been, including when, you know, two major time spans where almost the entire earth was at war with one another. Now it's really tough and stressful. All right, then let's go ahead and read this. More than half of the American millennials, 58%, say that life today is more stressful than ever before. And one third believe, quote, their lives are more stressful than the average person's life, according to a recent survey. Boy, this is just the epitome of victimhood status, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody's life is more horrible than mine. Anyway, the one poll survey commissioned by Etika asked 2,000 Americans ages 22 through 37 about their overall stress levels, as well as their top causes for frustration. Interestingly, supposedly hot-button issues of the day, such as climate change or racial equality, didn't even make the list. So despite the fact that the media has constantly told us that we're all going to die and the world's just going to be a giant fireball in 12 years and all this other crazy stuff, that doesn't even make the top, uh, top part of the list. Which, I don't know, does make me feel a little bit better that stuff like that and racial inequality are not the reasons. But when you read the actual reasons, I think you might say, well, okay, that's it's not really the best substitute for those things. Because at least if someone genuinely believed, as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says, like the world's like going to like end in like 12 years and stuff. I mean, if they believed that, then at least you could understand why they were so stressed out that even if it's based on something that isn't true, you would at least be able to get where they're coming from. But some of the things on this list are just ridiculous. I'm going to read them in reverse order. Number 16, check engine light coming on. Okay, I'm going to be honest. I don't get that one at all because my check engine light has been on for like two years. <laughs> the only time that I start stressing out when I see a light on my gauge is low gas, low oil, or the engine's overheating. Any of those things happen, then I'm stressed. Check engine light, not so much. Uh, I'm not saying that you should ignore it. I'm just saying that I have and I've been fine. Credit card bills. Okay, that one I can kind of see being stressful. Being in debt can be pretty stressful. Phone screen breaking. Is this really the biggest problem in your life? Now... <laughs> I know that it's inconvenient, but are you really laying awake at night, staring at the ceiling, thinking about how horrible your life is because your phone screen is broken? <laughs> Especially considering that this problem can be solved with a five to ten dollar screen protector. I don't see how this is really a big stress factor here. Job interviews. Job interviews can be stressful, I guess. I've never really found them stressful, but I guess some people can kind of see them as stressful. You know, not as stressful as some of the things previously in human history, but still, I guess I could see how that would sort of stress you out. Paying bills, yeah, that's stressful. Losing or misplacing keys. It, it's inconvenient, sure, but it's not like you can't function as a person because you've lost your keys. In fact... In our modern world, there are lots of solutions to this. They have key rings that you can clap and they'll, you know, sound off. They have different companies where you can attach something to your keys and find them with an app. And so I just really don't understand how that's something that stresses you out. Forgetting your phone charger. Done that one multiple times. 
phone chargers are everywhere and they're super cheap. I mean, would it suck to leave your phone charger at home and you have to go to a gas station and buy, spend another $5 on a phone charger? Yeah, it sucks. But is this really something that is causing a lot of stress in your life? Credit card fraud. Again, I can kind of see that one as being stressful. Phone battery dying. <laughs> if anything, that's indicative that we are way too attached to our phones, that that happens to be number seven. That's really the thing that causes you to flip out and go into a frenzy. I really love watching 90s sitcoms because I've recently been going through Friends again. And it's really funny where they have to stop and go find a payphone or something like that. Or they'll say, call me, I'll be home at this time. Because for a lot of, especially the early part of when Friends was popular and on TV, cell phones, cell phones weren't even a common thing. And now your cell phone battery dying, not your cell phone going away, or not you not having a cell phone for several months, just your battery dying and you have to go home to charge it before you can use it again. That's the big stressor here, apparently. Slow Wi-Fi. Okay, this one, this one really takes the cake. That slow Wi-Fi is the biggest stressor in your life. And the reason that I say that is, think about how amazing Wi-Fi is. When you compare it to the telegraph and the telephone and all this other technology, you're looking back on Wi-Fi, which is your cell phone, a computer in your hand is simultaneously connected to and communicating with every single other smartphone and tablet and computer on earth. And you have literally the collected wisdom of all mankind in your palm and it's not loading fast enough for you. And that's your big stress factor. I mean, come on, man. Slow Wi-Fi is annoying, but it's not the end of the world. Good gracious. Uh, number five, arriving to work late. Yeah, I've been guilty of that one before. Arriving late to work is is kind of stressful. I still think that they're way overplaying it. Number four, losing phone. Man, it, it's just remarkable how many of these are connected to not being able to use your phone. Is losing your phone a big deal? Yeah, but you can usually find it. And that's what's amazing to me. Almost all of these, you'll notice, there's a very simple and cheap way to fix all of these problems just about it. Uh, there are some exceptions, but by and large, most of these can be solved with an app that's free. Losing your phone, co uh, commute or traffic delays. Yeah, traffic's stressful. I still think that they're way overblowing this. Number two, arguing with a partner. Can't really talk about that when don't have a partner to argue with. I argue with people all the time, and I don't find it stressful, so I imagine arguing with a partner wouldn't be any different. But arguing with a partner, I don't know. Maybe that's stressful. Maybe it's not. I can't really speak to that one. And number one, losing your wallet or credit card. Okay, granted, losing your wallet or credit card is very stressful. But you know what you can do? Call your bank and cancel it. Or call your credit card company and cancel it. And nine times out of 10, if you're reporting it at stolen and they already have made some purchases, they'll usually waive the fee. And there are even some credit cards now that you can flip off. You can actually turn off credit card use. You can freeze your, your credit card account. And so again, it just amazes somehow that's the number one thing. I mean, yeah, it's stressful and yeah, these things are problems, but are we really comparing this to problems of the past? They're saying that this is what makes their life more stressful than any other person in history. That life now is more stressful than it's ever been. When you think about that and you had people that were literally in the frontier days, leaving their entire life behind, packing up everything into a wagon, not a car, a wagon pulled by a horse and going out and trying to start a new life in the wide open frontier where their nearest neighbor might be 20 miles away. And it's not exactly like you can get to the nearest neighbor very quickly because you don't have a car. You really think that your life is more stressful than their life. <laughs> and here's the bottom line on this. If you want to know why a lot of old people 
And it, it's not right to judge somebody just based on their age. Cause there's a lot of really smart, hardworking millennials that I've worked with. And you know, I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush, but if you want to know why the general feeling, the general perception of young people is that they're a bunch of ungrateful, whiny children by old people. Look at that. Look at that list, that, that top 16 list that we just looked at of things that stress them out. If you're somebody that at the age of 18 was running onto a beach at six, seven o'clock in the morning while literal Nazis were firing bullets at you and you're listening to somebody complain about how stressful their life is because their phone battery died. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's not a lot of sympathy there. There's not. And that's why older people, especially if you're talking about the greatest generation, even if you're talking about generations that aren't necessarily going back to World War II, people that fought in wars like in Korea or in Vietnam, it's really hard to look back at that and seeing people that worked their whole life and barely made ends meet and provided for their family, looking at people complaining about their phones and complaining about the Wi-Fi being too slow and trying to take them seriously. That's why a lot of older people, whether it's justified or not, or whether they paint with too broad a brush or not, that's why this general sentiment that this generation is a bunch of whiny, spoiled brats kind of exists. Because if you're looking at that list, it kind of confirms that stereotype. Not saying it's right for everybody, but let's be honest, if that's the way you lived your life, and you really were worried, even in the Cold War, for example, of a foreign power sending a nuclear bomb to your country. And everybody now is complaining about technology you didn't even have as a child as being the biggest thing that stresses them out. Conveniences that didn't even exist when you were younger. Them not being there and ready for them at every second of every day. That's the problem that they have. That's the reason they're saying their life is just so hard. Yeah, that's why that perception exists. So being a millennial myself, I wanted to pick on my own a little bit. Look, millennials have a lot going for them. There's a lot of good about this new generation, and we are living in a time that is wonderful, and there is going to be so much technological advancement. There is so much good that we can do in the world, but if we want to do that good, we are going to have to toughen up. There is just no way around it. We've got to grow up. We've got to realize that our lives are not that stressful. We're living in the best time the most convenient time that has ever existed in human history. And it wouldn't kill us to have a little bit of gratitude and a little bit of eagerness to use that technology to our benefit rather than complaining about it. That's all I have to say on that. And one thing that I would like to mention as well, if we're looking at the news cycle in this political week, you have got to be looking back at this week and think, oh my gosh, if Donald Trump were given the assignment of Mr. President, sit down and write down what would be your perfect news week. I don't even think he could come up with a news week as good as this week has been for President Trump. Literally every day this week has been a wonderful news day for the president. Now, sometimes he has bad ones. Don't get me wrong, but this has probably been at least from Trump's personal perspective, the best week of his presidency. And the Mueller report is a big part of that. But it's not even so much that the Mueller report came out and cleared him of all charges, cleared him of, not even cleared him of all charges, just exonerated him of any wrongdoing when it came to collusion and said that there's nothing that would reach to the level of criminal activity on the other question of obstruction of justice. I mean, that was good enough. But really what the benefit for the president is mostly is how the left reacted to it, how the left has been reacting to the Mueller investigation this entire time and building it up into this huge bombshell that's going to destroy President Trump's candidacy or his candidacy in 2020, if not get him impeached. Because they built it up so much and because of the way that they're reacting to it now, you couldn't ask for President Trump to write himself a better Newsweek than this. But it didn't stop there. Jesse Smollett and Nicki Minaj uh, basically having these horrible allegations lobbed against them of perpetrating a, a hate crime hoax in Smollett's case. 
and then being cleared of all charges. Look, regardless of how you feel about that, when you're looking at President Trump's base, that is one of those cultural issues that proves what Trump is saying, which is the left can get away with murder and conservatives are expected to tiptoe around everything. And he's exactly right, because this has been one of the central messages that he's been putting out there since he was campaigning, that the right is held to a much higher standard by the media and by the left than anyone on the left is, that there is no one in America, at least in this day in America, that is more privileged than somebody that has a huge stack of intersectionality labels like Jesse Smollett, who happens to be a gay black actor, or somebody that happens to be on the left that essentially all your sins are excusable as long as you happen to politically agree with the left and have friends in high places like Smollett does with the Obamas. You could not have crafted a story that better drums up the Trump base and gets them excited about something than this story. And the reason is because it shows the huge hypocrisy of the media. And also, New Zealand freaking out and trying to do a massive gun grab with forced, and I'm talking about absolutely mandatory buybacks, and then completely face planning on that. They gathered 36 guns. 36 guns. <laughs> Nowhere even close to getting rid of all of the quote-unquote, assault rifles that they were trying to do. And so just a shining example of another first world country that freaked out and lost its mind after a mass shooting, and then none of the policies that they enacted in reaction to that doing any good whatsoever. That is another massive win for the presidency. So, I mean, basically the entire week has been like this, and then it was all topped off with the Senate completely shutting down the Green New Deal, not a single Democrat senator voting for it. We're going to get to that, that issue in just a second. But the, the week sort of ending on that note, I mean, good gracious, you couldn't plan a better news week than that. But it gets even better. And we don't have all of the details yet, but there was a report of a, uh, a woman now accusing Joe Biden of all this sexual abuse and sexual misconduct towards her. And I mean, this is something we've kind of known about Joe Biden for a while. And keep in mind that Joe Biden is right now, it looks like he is the most credible threat to the Trump presidency. So, I mean, literally everything that is going on, everything is coming up Trump. He, this has been an amazing news week for the president. Whether you agree with him or not, whether you like him or not, you have to look at this news week and go, good gracious. I mean, when it comes to him, everything has gone his way this week. And I think a lot of that has to do with not so much even the stories themselves, but how the left and the media reacted to it. The fact that the left and the media reacted to especially the Smollett case and especially the Mueller report, the way that they've reacted to it and tried to deny truth and tried to intentionally put out fake news to try to cover their own butt. That has been probably the biggest win for the presidency because, as I've said for a long time, I'm not the first person to say this. Other conservative pundits have also talked about this ad nauseum. Trump's candidacy was really a rebuke of the media, even more so than it was a rebuke of the Democrat Party. It was even more so a rebuke of the media than it was a rebuke of Hillary Clinton. Because that was the core thing. That's what got people whipped up. That's what got people excited to vote for him. They're saying, yeah, these guys don't understand us at all. And here's somebody that talks like we want him to talk. Somebody that is just going to sit there and say, no, you guys are full of it. That was one of the main things that drew a lot of Trump supporters to his side. And it was one of the very few things that even back when he was candidate Trump, that I was very enthusiastic about. I think I said this probably back when it first started. I said, look, there is one thing that Trump does just an amazing, amazing job at, and that is going after the media. And that really is, I'm still convinced, what propelled him on to victory in the election. And the media has just stepped in it over and over and over again, and they continue to do it and continue to do it. 
And this week was no exception. The week, the news was really good for Trump and the way the media reacted to it made it even better for Trump. All right. So I know that since I've been back on the air, since we did a relaunch of the show, we haven't had a chance to do this because I've been uh, trying to find the right time to relaunch it and to get everything back into order, get back to our regular schedule. Well, it's starting today, the return of the Daily Dose of Stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. And today's dose of da- today's Daily Dose of Stupid You guessed it, it's about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I really am going to have to change the name of this segment to the Daily Dose of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because she seems to be, whenever something stupid happens in the country, she seems to be right at the middle of it. So here's a clip of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with this scathing rebuke of Congress completely rejecting her proposal for the Green New Deal. Let's take a look. Talk about... Uh, the concern of the environment as an elitist concern. One year ago, I was waitressing in a taco shop in downtown Manhattan. I just got health insurance for the first time a month ago. Again, what is that? This is not an elitist issue. This is a quality of life issue. You want to tell people that their concern and their desire for clean air and clean water is elitist? Tell that to the kids in the South Bronx, which are suffering from the highest rates of childhood asthma in the country. Tell that to the families in Flint, whose kids have their blood is ascending in, in lead levels. Their brains are damaged for the rest of their lives. Call them elitist. You're telling them that those kids are trying to get on a plane to Davos? People are dying. They are dying. And the response across the other side of the aisle is to introduce an amendment five minutes before a hearing and a markup. This is serious. This should not be a partisan issue. This is about our constituents and all of our lives. Iowa, Nebraska, broad swaths, swaths of the Midwest are drowning right now underwater. Farms, towns that will never be recovered and never come back. And we're here and and people are more concerned about helping oil companies than helping their own families. I don't think so. I don't think so. This is about our lives. This is about American lives. And it should not be partisan. Science should not be partisan. We are facing a national crisis. (laughs) So in typical... Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez fashion. All right. So first I, I want to talk about the media response to this because I, I saw so many different headlines and articles about this and just about all of them characterized her speech there in the same way. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gives a scathing rebuke of Congress in the wake of her Green New Deal not passing. And uh, the one that I saw, probably the word that was used more in any of these headlines than, than all the others was passionate, which you have to say, that's accurate. It was pretty passionate. You just saw it. But the thing is, passion does not equal being correct. That's the thing that a lot of people need to get over. That just because someone is angry about something or just because someone speaks in a way that it's very emotional does not mean that they're correct on the issue. For example, I could correct, uh, I could speak very passionately about the terrible things that are happening right now in Narnia, but it doesn't mean that they're actually happening. I mean, I could craft a speech because of my knowledge of, of the Chronicles of Narnia. I could craft a speech that I would be talking very passionately about how we need to go to Narnia and help them, but it wouldn't make a difference because Just me being passionate about it doesn't make Narnia a real place. And that's the thing that people don't really understand is that just because a rebuke or a speech of any kind is passionate and has fervor does not mean it is rooted in truth. That's something that we really need to remember. And the thing is, she really does come off as the angry teenage girl that is upset and overdramatic about everything. For example, if you've ever dealt with a teenage girl, they act like every problem is the end of the earth. 
And in her, her case, she actually does act like every problem is the end of the earth because she still thinks the earth is like going to end in 12 years or something. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez playing the part of a dramatic teenage girl that every problem is the end of the planet. Every single little thing that happens to her is the worst thing that has ever happened to anybody. And it just so greatly uh, coincides with the study that we just looked at that millennials are saying their lives are more stressful than it's ever been in the history of mankind. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez seems to kind of go along with that. She's kind of like the girl's like, if I don't get that dress, I'm just going to die. That's how she comes off. Just because you're passionate about something doesn't make you right. You can be angry. You can, you know, stomp your foot and furrow your brow all you want. Still doesn't make you right. And it still doesn't mean that people are going to cave to you just because you happen to be passionate about something because she really is that way she acts like a teenage girl that if she holds her breath or pitches a fit or shows her tail enough that she thinks people are going to come over to her side. Look, making compelling arguments is my trade. It's what I do for a living. It's what I'm doing right now. But here's the thing. When I come up across somebody that I disagree with, first of all, losing your temper is the worst thing you can do. And second of all, I understand that in order to get them to do what I want them to or to change their way of thinking and think the way that I think is correct, then I need to state my position and there needs to be an exchange of ideas. And I need to explain it in such a way that they can comprehend what I'm saying, take it in and make a decision for themselves. That's how a debate or a discussion or an argument about a particular issue is supposed to function. There's supposed to be a mutual understanding there and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you change people's minds, most of the time you don't. But the thing is, I understand that it is incumbent upon me to present my ideas and my beliefs in such a way that they can understand it and that it will be convincing and compelling enough that they will take what I'm saying seriously. This is a concept Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez does not understand because her whole life, all she's ever had to do is speak passionately and pitch a fit, and she usually gets her way. I mean, that's essentially what she did to get in office, is she was talking about how terrible things are and how terrible Trump is and just made a big stink about it, and voters gave her exactly what she wanted, which is to be elected. And so this is somebody that doesn't understand how to convince somebody that doesn't agree with her. That's the reason she never goes on any shows or has is a guest on any program of somebody that has views other than her. There are plenty of Democrat senators and Democrat House members that I vehemently disagree with. But yeah, they'll go on Fox News or they'll go on The Blaze or they'll talk to people like that. And I respect them for it. Don't agree with them, but still respect them. AOC does none of this. She never goes anywhere where she knows that there's going to be anything less than a completely sympathetic audience an audience that is going to completely agree with every word that she says. And that display really shows why. Because she does not know how to have a productive discussion with anyone that disagrees with her on anything. And that's the reason that she never goes anywhere if there are going to be people that disagree with her. That's really what this all boils down to. And what's really strange is most of this tirade actually has nothing to do with the Green New Deal. She starts talking about how she was working in a taco place and, I don't know, getting health insurance for the first time or whatever, which, by the way, is a complete lie because I guess up until the age of 26, she would have still been on her parents. And she's only 29 now, so maybe there was a lapse. But best case scenario, that would be a lapse of, what, three years? And yeah, it's ridiculous that she's able to stay on her parents' insurance until she's 26 because of ACA. But still, the point is that she only would have, according to her, not been on health insurance at that point. And considering she comes from a pretty wealthy family, I kind of doubt that if anything bad had happened to her, that she would have been in any trouble. But nonetheless, won't linger on that too much. One thing that she talked about, too, is that she was complaining about people in the Bronx with asthma and people in Flint, Michigan, having levels of lead in their blood. These are both real concerns. I don't know a whole lot about the Bronx, haven't really studied that issue, but here's the thing, 
isn't she supposed to be from the Bronx? I mean, I know not originally. She grew up in a very nice, wealthy neighborhood. But I'm talking about, isn't she from that area? And if that was a problem, shouldn't she be doing something there at the local level to fix that? If their air pollution is so bad that it's giving kids asthma? That it's causing problems for them? Shouldn't she have been running for a local office then? The idea that the Bronx are having problems and because of that we need to put down this massive sweeping regulation that affects people in Texas and Alabama and North Dakota and all these other places that aren't having these problems, that doesn't really make any sense. And did you notice something else about that? These areas that you mentioned, like the Bronx, like Flint, Michigan, those are deep, deep blue Democrat strongholds. The entire city council of Flint, Michigan, and the mayor, all Democrats. Bronx, pretty much impossible to get elected unless you're a Democrat. Let's be honest. The only reason that she's sitting in office right now is because the Bronx is deep, deep blue. And so because of that, because there's no way this person would have won in an even somewhat contentious race. And so because of that, she's saying that there's all these horrible environmental problems, and then she's waggling her finger, literally wagging her finger at the other side when the places that you just mentioned that are having these issues are Democrat-controlled areas. Seems to me before you waggle your finger, you need to consider maybe there's something the Democrats should be doing on this. And furthermore, let's also note that she's talking about the other side but it was her side that refused to vote for it, including a bunch of the senators that are running for president now that said they would support it, and then when it came time, they voted present, would not vote for the Green New Deal, did not want to be on record as having voted in favor of this. Not even freaking Bernie Sanders, as crazy as he is, decided, nope, not going to vote for it. Man. It's just amazing to me. And uh, Mitch McConnell, when he did bring this up for a vote, and you got to hand it to Cocaine Mitch, he played them like a fiddle. And he played them like a fiddle by giving them exactly what they wanted. It's like, oh, you, you, want it, you think it's such an important thing? You think that there's all these people dying and it's so urgent and we have to do this right now or the world's going to end? Okay, let's vote on it. And they all voted present. Didn't vote no, but certainly didn't vote yes. Did not want to be put on record as voting in favor of that. Even the farthest left of the left-leaning senators were like, yeah, this thing's a nightmare. And I really love that there was so much commentary on this from people on the left. One of the people actually said Mitch McConnell sabotaged the Green New Deal. He sabotaged the Green New Deal by letting people vote on it? Think about that. All these people were saying, we have to have the Green New Deal. It's such a great proposal. It's so good. It's going to help the planet. Okay, let's vote on it. Uh, no, no. I've never seen anybody suggest that they were being sabotaged by giving them exactly what they wanted. I mean, in a sense, he did sabotage them, but that was just by calling their bluff. It's not that he did something tricky or underhanded. He just said, all right, y'all want to vote for it? Sure, we'll call it up for a vote. Because he knew there was no way that the Democrats were actually going to sign on to it when push came to shove. And that brings me to a larger point, both by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Democrats at large. They don't really believe the world is in imminent danger. They say it because they know it's popular with their base. They say it because it's fear-mongering and it drums up votes. But none of them really believe it. Because if they did, they would have voted for it. If they really believed that this was a huge monstrosity that was going to destroy the entire world, an extinction-level event, then they would take the stance of, okay, we need to do everything that we can. But they don't. By the way, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is not an exception to that rule. I think she believes it more than most people, but the thing is, she doesn't really believe it either. She was saying in an interview not too long ago that, well, you know, nobody's perfect, and sometimes 
I don't recycle things because it's just too far to walk to the other container. And yeah, I still use transportation and I still fly on airplanes and all this other stuff. And I'm thinking, if you really believe that what you were doing was truly immoral and destroying the planet, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do it. If you really believe that it was that big a deal, that it was that important, then you would make some sacrifices in your own personal life. And she doesn't. Remember how mad she got when somebody was taking a picture of her, I guess it was one of her advisors, her top advisors, that was sitting down to dinner with her eating a giant cheeseburger, even though Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had just said the other day, we need to stop eating beef because it's killing the planet. Yeah, they don't believe it. It is a ploy to get votes and nothing more. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a great example of that. Although I will say this, she kept saying, well, the other side of the aisle and this shouldn't be a partisan issue. I guess technically now it's not because every single senator refused to vote for it, Republicans and Democrats. So I guess technically it is a nonpartisan issue now. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, and, and I'll bring up one other thing in this too. One thing that she said and one point that she made was that are we helping oil companies over families? I don't think so. Okay, here's the thing. Why do you assume that families aren't helped by oil companies? And I'm not a fan of crony capitalism. I'm not saying that the government ought to be giving handouts to them or anything like that. But I'm just saying, why do you demonize oil companies? Why do you think that not passing the Green New Deal was putting oil companies ahead of families? Because I don't remember anything actually in the Green New Deal, and I've read the entire thing, about oil companies specifically. But the idea that oil doesn't help families doesn't make any sense. I mean, don't aren't there a lot of families that are provided for by oil companies? I, look, I live in Alabama, and you all know that. And we have Mobile. And a lot of money in Mobile and Baldwin County and the areas surrounding the Gulf come from oil. A lot of people have jobs with oil companies. They work on oil rigs, really good paying jobs. A lot of families put food on their table because of revenue that they get from oil. And by the way, it's not just families that work for oil companies, even though that's a really big part of the economy in a lot of different states. It's also people that buy that product. The fact that we have cheap, affordable energy, like oil, like gasoline, like diesel, all of these different things give us family vacations, the ability to drive around at a reasonable price, the ability to go to church. And let's not forget that oil affects the price of everything else. If oil were to simply vanish, do you know how hard it would be for us to stock our grocery stores? I mean, it'd be darn near impossible, especially when you're talking about foods that aren't necessarily native to one particular part of the country or that would be seasonal if it were not for being able to grow certain crops in warmer or colder climates. And so because of that, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tries to put up this false dichotomy of we have to pick between helping families and helping oil companies. Well, I don't think that the government should be helping oil companies in the sense that I don't think it should be giving them handouts. But I certainly don't think it should be going after oil companies because that hurts families too. It gives them more expensive everything. Clothes, food, housing. All of that stuff takes energy. 70% of our energy electricity comes from coal. And so this idea that we need to be environmentally conscious and that's somehow going to help families, passing this Green New Deal would be incredibly expensive and hurt every family in America. So not passing the Green New Deal was the best thing that you could do for families. And one other thing that she did bring up, I agree, science shouldn't be partisan, which is exactly the reason the government needs to be out of it. There shouldn't be government grants for scientific research because once the government gets involved, science becomes skewed. Once the government gets involved, you start having problems with scientists nudging their data just a little bit to get the results that they need to justify their funding. And I won't go into the whole problem right now, but the point is 
if we want science to be bipartisan or I guess nonpartisan would be the better way to state it. The best way that we can do that, the best way that we can do that is to get the government out of the business of funding science and picking winners and losers when it comes to scientific research. That's part of the reason that this whole global warming fiasco has grown to the cli uh, has climbed to the heights that it has now that it's become such a popular theory is because the government kept funding research that showed the data in one specific way. And that's part of the reason that it's reached the fever pitch that it has now. By the way, I would like to note, all of this happened while the previously fastest shrinking glacier on Earth became one of the fastest growing glaciers on Earth. So according to NASA, they reported that they were stumped by Greenland's Jakoshevan Glacier, I hope I'm pronouncing that even somewhere close to correctly, uh, the Jaco uh, Jakoshevan Glacier suddenly growing in its ice from 2017 to 2018. So in other words, this glacier, which was previously the fastest shrinking glacier in the world, and climate change alarmists were commonly referring back to that glacier and, and showing how quickly it was shrinking as a sign that we need to do something to stop global warming. Yeah, its shrinking stopped in 2014, and according to a new report that was released on Monday, it actually started growing, growing at a pretty quick rate, one of the fastest in the world. And one of the explanations that was offered by scientists is they said, well, the Atlantic is going through a cooling phase now, that it just goes through different cycles, and now the Atlantic is actually cooler than it was in the year beforehand, and that's what accounts for the glacier getting bigger. Which, by the way, would go along with what most people that are at least somewhat skeptical of this climate change narrative, at least the apocalyptic version of it, have been saying for a long time, which is the climate runs in cycles. You have some periods where it's a little warmer, some periods where it's a little cooler. And this thing just keeps going back and forth, always has, always will. We're seeing some changes in climate, sure, but the climate changes all the time. And so all this happening, all this alarmism, all of this talk about people dying and this being our World War II and we've got to do something to stop it right now, all while the data is showing that really this is just something that cycles through. The Earth's climate travels in phases. Sometimes it's a little warmer, sometimes it's a little cooler. But the idea that the world is going to turn into a fireball in 12 years if we don't give you everything you want is utterly absurd. And this is just, it's so pathetic because she looks like a screaming toddler that's mad that she didn't get exactly what she wants. And because of that, she's just screaming out of rage. She's screaming because she doesn't know what else to do. So that being said, let's go on to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Okay, Chaplain's Report today, um, I love this passage. I really do, and the reason that I do is because there are certain passages in God's Word that are very straightforward, and while the message in them is very powerful, they're a little less layered than others. But being the sort of philosophical guy that I am, I've always really liked passages that you can draw several different lessons from them. And it's not that they're contradictory. They all work in, synch uh, in, in perfect synchronization. There's a synergy that, that comes from them. But this is one of those passages. There's so many different layers upon layers that you can draw from it because the Word of God is inexhaustible. The Word of God is definitely the work of something a human mind could have just never conceived some of the ways that there are multiple lessons and some passages only make sense when, uh, or make more sense when you cross-reference it with, with others. 
And that's the reason that biblical study has always been something that fascinated me is because it's really a look into the mind of God and his infinite wisdom that you can constantly draw new messages out of even the same passage. And this passage is no different. Now, for this, we look to the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. You're probably familiar with it, even if you're not someone that's very well-versed in the scripture, because you hear this passage at weddings all the time. You know, love does not seek its own, that kind of thing. And so after that, after that part where Paul is describing Christian love and the way that we're supposed to love one another, he goes into this part which on its surface seems a little out of place, but I think reading it, you'll be able to see how it plays into this concept of love and godly love that Paul is talking about. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 11. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now, this is a truly awesome piece of scripture, and part of the reason for that is because it has so many layers, so much wisdom that we can extrapolate out of it. The first layer is maturity. That one's pretty obvious. Paul is giving us an understanding of what it is like to mature spiritually and physically, and he's drawing an analogy between a Christian spiritual walk and the natural physical growth of a child into a man. And he's using his own life as part of an example for this. So what Paul says here is that when you're a kid, there are certain behaviors that are acceptable. There are certain behaviors that we tolerate that we would never tolerate out of, a, out of an adult. And that's one of the reasons that a pretty good parenting strategy that I've seen other people use, because of course I'm not a parent myself, is, hey, act your age. Because it calls us to behave in a manner that we understand is more similar to a more mature person than us. It calls us to a higher standard of behavior. There are certain things that we'll certainly tolerate in a two-year-old that we would never tolerate from a 20-year-old, and we shouldn't because there is a higher expectation because that person should have accrued more maturity than a two-year-old by that point. And so because of that, there are certain behaviors in the Christian life that would be understandable and acceptable for someone who wasn't very familiar with the Word of God yet, who is just starting on this journey of repentance and really transforming themselves and sanctifying their lives. There are some things that are acceptable or even not necessarily acceptable, but certainly understandable for somebody that's very young in the faith. But at a certain point, we're supposed to mature past that. We're supposed to grow out of those spiritually immature sort of childish ideas that we have. And this is something that Paul is trying to make very clear here. He's saying that I put away these childish things when I became a man. And there are certain problems that you guys in Corinth are having that you are more mature than this, or at least should be by this point. And because of that, some of these practices that you engaged in as a very young church filled with a lot of young Christians, you guys have to mature. You have to be better than this by this point. And so this is really the message that he's given. You know, it reminds me of a great joke by Jeff Foxworthy where he said, uh, I have these friends that think their kid is going to be the, the next super genius in the world because he stands out in the backyard and yells, airplane, airplane. And I said to him, well, good gracious, he's 14 years old. <laughs> so that's kind of the same thing. There is That would be impressive for a really young child, but if you've got a 14-year-old doing it, that is really not what you should be looking for for somebody that has acquired that age. And in the same sense, the reason that Paul is talking about love here is that he's saying, hey, you guys should have moved into a more mature version of love. You guys should have moved into a more godly style of love to where you're not dealing with all these petty differences and the infighting with one another, and you're less focused on the stuff that doesn't matter and more focused 
on your worship, more focused on your unity with one another. You guys should have matured past this point by now. And then there's the second layer, which is maturing in that love. Because love and relationships, they almost take on a life of their own. Your relationship between a person, especially somebody that you're close to, should also mature as it goes on. Not just your love as an individual and the love that you're able to show each other, but also the relationship itself should grow and evolve and become better and closer the longer you engage in it. Because even somebody that has a very mature love, once you take on the responsibility of a relationship, and I'm not talking necessarily romantic, I'm talking about parent, child, I'm talking about just your friends or brothers in Christ. Even if you're really good and have a very mature love, developing that relationship is going to take time. And so because of that, he talks about a second layer that, this second layer of understanding that once we have established a relationship with somebody, the relationship itself is also supposed to mature and grow. Because this is the reason really you'll see old married couples versus childhood sweethearts. Um, you know, if, if you're in high school and you're dating somebody, you tend to let the little things get to you. And this is understandable because you're somebody that's new to relationships and the relationship itself is very new as well. And so you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks and hiccups. And it's not going to be as fulfilling as, for example, a married couple that has been with each other for a really long time. And so this maturing of the relationship itself is something that Corinth had a struggle with because the people at Corinth were not engaging their brothers and sisters in Christ in a way that was productive or a way that they should. Because they were so focused on their spiritual gifts, things like prophecy and speaking in tongues, that they were ignoring the spiritual growth they were supposed to be experiencing from that. They were ignoring their own spiritual growth. They were ignoring the understanding of the prophecy that they were giving rather than the fact that they could prophesy. They were so focused on the gift, they forgot to look at the benefit that the gift gave them and that it was supposed to make them more spiritually mature. And they were so focused on having the ability itself that they forgot to understand what the gift was put there to teach them. And that was really tragic. And then you have this third layer, that maturity brings foresight. You see, one of the things that Paul mentions earlier is that love suffereth long. In other words, love has a lot of patience. And the reason for that is that a mature love and a mature Christian has some foresight. He understands that what is in front of him at every second of every day is not necessarily all that important if you're not looking at it from the big picture, if you're not looking at how it's going to affect the future. And this is part of the reason that he gives this analogy. He says right before he goes into verse 11, he says, We know prophecy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. So he's saying, yeah, prophecy is a great thing, but you're forgetting that we're going to hit a time eventually where the prophecy doesn't matter because the thing that we were prophesying about has come. And because of that, you need to be focused on what the prophecy is trying to teach you more so than the prophecy itself. Because at some point, everything on this earth is going to be done away with. Everything that we've built, everything that we've done, it's all going to be gone. And none of that is going to matter if we haven't done what we were supposed to do in relation to God. If we haven't fulfilled our spiritual duties to our Savior and our Father, then it really doesn't matter what we do here on earth. You see, love is supposed to grant us a certain foresight. Our love for God is supposed to help us understand that we need to do things that please Him because eventually He's going to be the only thing left. And our relationship with Him is going to matter more than anything else. Couples that have been at it for a long time, like I used in the analogy right before, an old married couple, you'll see that sometimes they do things to work on the relationship because they know if they don't work on it now, they know from experience that they're going to experience troubles later on. They do things to avoid trouble and to strengthen the relationship now so that they're not in crisis mode when something big happens later. 
And so that maturity and that maturity in love does bring foresight. So that's the third layer. And you see, that's the reason that it works so well with his analogy of adults and children. Children are very impulsive. And they really don't think much further than five seconds into the future and what they're going to be doing then. Adults, they have to plan for the future. That's why they work, because they know eventually I'm going to get hungry and need a place to sleep. So I've got to work now so I can put off worrying about that kind of stuff later. We sacrifice the future for what's going on now. Or we, sorry, we sacrifice now for what's going to happen in the future. We sacrifice what we'd like to be doing now, which is sitting at home eating cheese puffs and watching TV. And instead we go to work because we know that we're going to need to prepare for our future at some point. And so we sacrifice right now so that we can be better in the future. And that's what a spiritually mature person does. They realize it's not all about them and what they want. They realize what it is about is God and his kingdom and doing the best that we can to establish his kingdom here on earth. And that's going to be better for us and for everybody else. And more importantly, it's what God wants. And so that spiritual maturity does bring foresight. Growing up isn't easy. But the thing is, we have to be willing to leave some things behind. We have to be willing to leave behind our old sinful lifestyle. We have to be willing to leave behind some of our own wants and desires that aren't even necessarily bad per se. But we forego them because we realize the work that God has asked us to do is just more important. And that's really something I want you to think about throughout this weekend and throughout the next week. That if we're going to have this strong, godlike, mature love that Paul calls us, calls, calls us to have, we have to put away childish things. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.